And we're going to hear from God's word now as it is read for us from the book of Jonah. Um, so thanks very much, Gwen, for bringing us the first part of that. The Old Testament reading is read from the book of Jonah, chapter 4, verses 1 to 6. Hear the word of the Lord. But to Jonah, this seemed very wrong, and he became angry. He prayed to the Lord, Isn't this what I said, Lord, when I was still at home? That is what I tried to forestall by fleeing to Tarshish. I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. Now, Lord, take away my life, for it is better for me to die than to live. But the Lord replied, Is it right for you to be angry? Jonah had gone out and sat down at a place east of the city. There he made himself a shelter, sat in its shade, and waited to see what would happen to the city. Then the Lord God provided a leafy plant and made it grow up over Jonah to give shade for his head to ease his discomfort. And Jonah was very happy about that plant. This is the word of the Lord. Good morning. We, we continue in Jonah from verse 7. But at dawn the next day, God provided a worm which chewed the plant so that it withered. When the sun rose, God provided a scorching east wind, and the sun blazed on Jonah's head so that he grew faint. He wanted to die and said, it would be better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about the plant? It is, he said. I am so angry, I wish I was dead. But the Lord said, you have been concerned about this plant, though you did not tend it or make it grow. It sprang up overnight and died overnight. And should I not have concern for the great city of Nineveh, in which there are more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left, and also many animals. There ends the reading. Our friends, do keep that passage open. I think Andy recently preached through the whole of Jonah. Am I right? Cool. Um, at Christchurch Cascades, we, we took four weeks to look at Jonah over our midweek July holiday. And so what we're going to do today is we're just going to zoom into to chapter four, which really is in one sense a conclusion to the book, um, which is not about Jonah, is not about a fish. It's not actually even about Jonah. It's a book about a God who is a compassionate savior. Now, um, who, can, who can remember off the top of their heads the slogan for Spur, the, the, the restaurant? Don't be scared. You know it well. I know you all know it well. People with a taste for life. People with a taste for life. It's a great tagline. Uh, people who enjoy good food, who enjoy time together, who enjoy life. Eat at spur. That's kind of their, their idea. People with a taste for life. And I've been thinking a lot about that slogan because it should be true of Christians. That should be something that is true of us. People with a taste for life and not just steak and burgers. And notice I say not just steak and burgers because those are great things to you. But we have a taste, a taste for life because we have experienced the wonderful grace of God. God is, is one who is on, on mission, uh, who has saved us from hell. And for heaven, we are alive as Christians. We meet together as people who have wonderful life. Jesus has brought us from death to life. We have tasted his grace and his mercy. And so we should then be a people with a taste for life. People who pray unceasingly, people who love incessantly, people who give sacrificially, who rejoice unwaveringly. And here in the book of Jonah, people who have the courage to speak courageously. We have been saved to save, to take this mission up. We've got a God who is on mission, who has rescued us and pulled us into his mission to reach others. And so today is a bit of a heart recalibration. We're going to have a look at the very heart of God, which will then, we pray, pull our hearts back into line with his, where perhaps we might have slipped out of line with him. Maybe we're not being a people with a taste for life. Let me pray for us one more time and we'll get going. Father, you have spoken. 
Thank you that you're not quiet. Thank you that you don't just leave us to uh, fumble through life without any direction, but you speak, you instruct, you teach, correct, rebuke, and train. And so we ask that you would do that for us this morning so that this coming week, we can live faithfully for you, our wonderful God and our compassionate Savior. Amen. Well, this chapter really um, puts two hearts together or, or compa a comparison side by side. Uh, we've got the heart of Jonah and we have the heart of God. Jonah has just preached the city of Nineveh. You'll know this, the story well. And Nineveh was a neighboring nation to Jonah's people, which Jonah was from the people of Israel, God's people. And uh, he was going to Nineveh, which was in Assyria. Now, in chapter three, he had preached that judgment from the Lord was coming to the city. And Nineveh did something incredible. They turned. They turned back to God. They, they were running one way, and God said, judgment is coming. And so they turned around. And the incredible thing is God also turned. As people turn, God turns. God turned his anger away. Like with the sailors in the storm in chapter one, if you know the story, like with Jonah in the belly of the fish in chapter two, God is on a mission to save. But this latest act of forgiveness makes Jonah spitting mad. I wonder if you noticed it in the, in the reading. Do you notice how he, he reacts to God relenting from judgment? If you've got your Bible open, verse one, Jonah, to Jonah, this seemed very wrong. And he became angry. So here he is. He's, he's furious at God. He resents this act of grace that God shows towards Nineveh. In fact, you can translate verse one as it was exceedingly evil to Jonah. He saw the actions of God as wicked. Jonah is disgusted that God could treat the Ninevites this way. Where is the justice, God? This is a despicable nation. And in Jonah's defense, that is true. It was known as the city of blood. Recent um, archaeological records that have been found on the, the Syrian empire detail how they, would, they, they were brutal to their enemies. They would, they would cut off their enemies' arms and noses and ears. They would skin and skewer people that they captured. And Nineveh was the royal city. And so in one sense, this, this was the heart of a bloodthirsty nation. In the book of Nahum, chapter 3, verse 1, they describe like this, Nineveh is described like this, Woe to you, city of blood, totally deceitful, full of plunder, never without, without prey. Who has not experienced your constant cruelty? And so for God to turn his anger away from this nation that is deserving of justice is no small thing. And so we want to just keep that in the back of our mind as, as Jonah is wrestling with this. But as they've turned and as God has relented, Jonah finds it's, he's, he's horrified. He's horrified. And I wonder if you notice what he prays. Look at verse two. He prays to the Lord, isn't this what I said, Lord, when I was still at home? This is what I, try, this is what I tried to forestall by fleeing to Tarshish. I knew you. I knew you were gracious. I knew you were compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. Now, Lord, take away my life. For it is better for me to die than to live. So, so Jonah says that it wasn't fear. So if you know the story of Jonah in chapter one, he's sent to go to Nineveh and he doesn't. He hot foots it the opposite direction to Tarshish. But it wasn't because he was scared of the Ninevites, even though they had this reputation of being a terrifying, bloodthirsty city. He knew that if he went and he started preaching there, that this God would show compassion. As one preacher speaking on this uh, text, uh, kind of trying to uh, have the, the conversation of, of Jonah's in his head, Jonah was probably thinking something like, it's just typical of you, Lord. It's just typical of you that you would be this loving. And I can't stand it. Jonah, I wonder if you notice there also, he quotes half of the name of, of God from Exodus 34, that he is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, abounding in in love. And there are five things that, that are in God's name here that he's very upset about. He says, I knew you were gracious. God gives people what they don't deserve. We all fall short of the glory of God, but he shows grace in that he sends a savior 
into the world to die in our place to forgive. It is by grace you have been saved, the Apostle Paul writes. You were dead in your sins, but you're now alive. God has done that, and he's gifted it to you, and the cost was borne by Jesus. A nice way to remember the word grace, G-R-A-C-E, and what it means, God's riches at Christ's expense, grace. God is wonderfully gracious. Secondly, God is compassionate, which means that he is he's merciful. He gives us what we don't deserve, but he also doesn't give us what we do deserve. Jesus takes the wrath of God. He, he tastes death for us so that we don't have to. That's mercy. So that we can now taste life. That's grace. So God is wonderfully compassionate. Thirdly, he's slow to anger. That means that he is long-suffering. Right? He, he is patient. He tolerates people who do terrible things because the apostle Peter tells us he wants people to be saved. And so he bears with us. He is wonderfully slow to anger. He's also abounding in love. Some translations uh, uh, translate that verse as he, he, is, he, he, is faith, he has faithful love. When God makes promises, he keeps them. He is faithful. And so we can be confident in this love that he shows to us. And he'll always do what is good and what is right. And it means that when we experience this forgiveness that he offers, even if I am unfaithful, he is still faithful, totally faithful. And so he's wonderfully faithful in his love. And fifthly, he relents. This is the, the thing that he's really angry about, or Jonah. God relents from sending disaster. Chapter three, when you turn like Nineveh does, when you repent and believe, God turns and relents from sending disaster. Because for us, we know, this is fully and finally satisfied by Jesus in our place. And so folks, God is a wonderful forgiver of sins. That is his heart. And Jonah can't stand it. He's just preached a sermon to a city. Uh, he, he's planted a church, effectively. Christ Church Nineveh has just sprung up overnight with 120,000 new members. Everyone in the church turned, we're told, in three days. It's a pastor's dream. And it's Jonah's worst nightmare. Forgive these Ninevites. How dare you? How dare you, God? Jonah sounds a little bit like the older brother uh, from the, the parable of the prodigal son. You know, the story, the, the son uh, takes his inheritance early. He rejects his family and his father, and he heads on out with, with money, and he goes and he squanders it in wild living, only to come back with his tail between his legs, hoping that his father would receive him back as a slave to work just so that he could, he could eat. And how does his father welcome him back? Not by giving him a shovel. He runs out. He runs out to meet him. He puts a ring on his finger, robes on his back, hugs him, and then he throws a huge party. Where's the older brother? He's outside having a fat sulk. He's grumpy with his father. You never, you never throw me any parties when his dad comes out to find where he is. What does his father say? Luke chapter 15, verse 31, he says, son, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. What was the older brother's problem? It's not fair. It's not fair that you welcome the younger brother back after all that he's done. He thinks that his brother should not receive any grace. He doesn't deserve it. Job doesn't want to see them in the vice saved. They don't deserve it. Look at them. God, look at them. I'd rather die than be a part of this and see this wretched people saved. But folks, that's what makes it grace. It is always undeserved. God has a heart for mission. Jonah only cares about his relationship with God. He cares only for his people of Israel, as if God must be restricted to saving only those that Jonah approves of. And so God asks him a question. 
in verse 4. He says, is it, is it right for you to be angry? Even, even God's question to Jonah is so patient, isn't it? He's slow to anger, remember? And Jonah, like a child, stomps off and has a little bit of a tantrum outside the city. And he goes up onto a hill, a place where he could watch what happens. Maybe he's thinking to himself, maybe I've changed God's mind. Maybe he'll come and nuke the Ninevites now. It feels a little bit like uh, when Jesus was with his disciples and, and, and a town had rejected Jesus and the disciples wanted to, to call on heaven to rain fire down on this village. But God doesn't leave Jonah in this current state. He needs to teach him. That's what God does. He doesn't leave us in our, in our brokenness and sin. He wants to instruct us. He wants to help us. He wants to correct us. And he, he began to do that in, in the belly of the, of the fish. See, Jonah's heart needs urgent recalibration. And so there, as he's sitting, as he's watching in on the city, God appoints a plant, much like he did appoint a fish to come and swallow Jonah. Verse 6, we're told a plant springs up and it gives Jonah shade. And we're told it, it, it's given shade to rescue Jonah's head from trouble. So I'm assuming maybe as a bald man, I don't, I don't really know. Case, he was really chuffed with this plant. It grows up over him, and, and there he is. He's sitting in some, some comfort, watching over Nineveh. But what does God do? The next day, he sends a worm to attack this plant, and the plant withers. And instead of a storm, like he sent in chapter 1, God now sends a strong, hot berg wind, much like that's what's blowing outside now. And there is Jonah, sweaty, faint, and at the end of verse 8, what does he say? It's better for me to die than to live. Then, ask, then God asks Jonah again, is it right for you to be angry about the plant? Yes, it is right, he replies. I'm angry enough to die. And here's the lesson. It's the, it's the concluding remark of the, of the book. The book of Jonah is probably written by Jonah years afterwards, reflecting on how God had taught him. And this is the conclusion, verse 10. The Lord said, you have been concerned about this plant, though you did not tend it or make it grow. It sprang up overnight and it died overnight. And should I, this is God, should I not have concern for the great city of Nineveh? in which there are more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right from their left, and also many animals. You care more about the plant than you do about people. You care more about the plant that you had no hand in making. Can I not care about 120,000 people, as well as all the animals in the city? These are God's creation. These are the people God has made. Yes, it is a city of blood. It is. And it is turned from God. But that doesn't mean he doesn't care for it. Jonah is not like God. Jonah, in one sense, is the, the reverse of God. If you look at the, the name of God, Jonah is the opposite, right? He has no grace, no compassion. He is quick to anger. He is not loving. And he just wants his, he wants his enemies gotten rid of. He is selfish. And he is only happy with grace for himself. And friends, I want to suggest that there's a lot of Jonah in us too. Who are the people that you would not want God to save? The obvious ones are probably those who have done you some kind of harm. Israel would have, would have been the victims of the wickedness of Nineveh. People may very well have hurt you in the past, injured you. And perhaps you would hate to see them forgiven by God. Who would make you feel uncomfortable walking through those doors on a Sunday? Are there people who you think cannot and should not receive God's grace and mercy? After the Second World War, a man named Henry Gericke was offered the least popular job in the U.S. Army. He was asked to be the chaplain. He was a pastor himself, Gericke, 
Uh, he was asked to be the chaplain of 20 odd high ranking Nazi officials who were all awaiting trial in Nuremberg. Serving in the war alongside his sons and seeing the brutality of D-Day and then the, the years following that of war, he obviously wrestled with, with this decision, but finally he accepted the job. Arriving in Nuremberg, he wrote at how, how first when he, he met these men, he was frightened by the evil that was so prevalent in them. But as he met them one-on-one, -on -one, he then began to invite them to a little church service that he started once a week. And eventually 15 of them began regularly attending. His ministry to, to these men became so important that when, when Gerica was, was due to fly back home to the States, uh, the, the, the prisoners wrote to Gerica's wife to say, please, please can we have him for a little longer? Gerica, like I said, had been a pastor many years, and, and he was certain by the time that these men had been ex executed after their trials, eight of them had made real and earnest professions of faith in Jesus. They'd become Christians. Those who had, the hand, had, had a hand in, in the death of some 50 million people, the question is, how do, you, how do you feel about that this morning? Do you feel God should have had mercy on them? Many didn't. So if, if your answer is, no, I don't feel like they should have received grace or mercy, you're in good company because many didn't. Gerica received hate mail from Christians, many Christians around the world. They called him a Nazi lover, a Jew hater, and a disgusting man for offering these men the gospel, for preaching for, to them, for caring for them. The forgiveness of Jesus is so big. What he achieves on the cross is so big that it can cover these men just as it could cover the people of, uh, of Nineveh. People like the Apostle Paul, who was there at the stoning of Stephen, a man who made it his life pursuit to chase after and imprison Christians before his conversion. God is a mission, and he is calling people to turn. Should we not be concerned? People who do not know their right from their left, those who are enemies of God. When Jesus came, he saw sinful people. And what did he do? What did Jesus do? What, what marked his ministry? He had compassion. Surprise, surprise. That the God man would come into the world and be compassionate. He had compassion on them. The, the word compassion has its root in the word for your, your innards, your guts. And the idea here is compassion is to have a gut-wrenching burden for people. Jesus ate with tax collectors and sinners, the worst of the worst in society, which made the religious leaders angry. They were mad, like Jonah. Why? Why were they angry? Because they only cared for themselves. Jesus had compassion on them because they were far from God. The religious leaders thought that they were worthy of the compassion of God. And they only wanted those who they saw as acceptable to receive grace from God. But Jesus came to heal the sick. He came for the sick, those who are broken. He has come for people who are far off to bring them near, to show them grace and mercy. Okay, I'm going to get controversial. Don't throw anything at me at this point in time. Hear me out. Hey, hear me out. When Jesus sees angry rioters like July last year, he has gut-wrenching compassion on them. When Jesus sees the squandering of money by our officials, he has gut-wrenching compassion on them. When Jesus sees the adulterer, when he sees the addict, the alcoholic, the homeless, he feels gut-wrenching compassion for them. That doesn't negate wrongdoing on their part. So don't hear, don't hear me saying that at all. But he is compassionate and he longs to forgive. Do we have any right 
if God chooses to then forgive. And so who is it for you? Who is it for you? Who might you think is disgusting for God to save? And have we perhaps forgotten that we have been the recipients of such wonderful, undeserved grace ourselves? And so others can too. They can receive this. Again, it doesn't negate, doesn't negate any wrongdoing on their part. But do we feel that they are too far gone for the grace of God? Now, it doesn't mean that we're going to go minister to people who have hurt us necessarily. Okay, the, the hurt might be too deep. It also might be that that person is, is, is a dangerous character. They might have hurt us really badly, and it would be like the lamb going to the wolf. Okay, so there's wisdom in all of this as well. But will we have compassion for them? Will we pray that God would open up their hearts and their eyes and work in them? And will we celebrate when God answers those prayers? We need to pray today. I need to pray today for gut-wrenching compassion so that we can be like God, gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in faithful love. It's what God is teaching Jonah. He's wanting our hearts to recalibrate to his, to have experienced this undeserved forgiveness ourselves and then to seek it out for those who need to find it too. A picture in the UK, I was reading a book by Richard Koken, uh, sort of a, a commentary on the book of Jonah as I was prepping. And um, he compares the city of London, which is not dissimilar from Peter Maritzburg or Howick, believe it or not, but he, he compares the city of London to the Titanic. And he says this, the loss of life was appalling. 1,500 people died, nearly 70% of those on board. And there are, made, there, are, there are many factors for this, but four major ones that he outlines. Firstly, a lack of lifeboats. There were way too few for the number of people on board. And then he writes this, we desperately need more gospel preaching churches in our city and suburbs. They're what? 22,000 people living in Howard, 25,000, somewhere around there. How many churches are there? Maybe four or five gospel preaching churches. We need more churches to be preaching. We're told that the harvest is plentiful. The workers are few. We need to pray that God would raise up workers. Second thing, there was a woeful lack of lifeboat training. The crew didn't know what to do in an emergency. We need books like the book of Jonah to fuel our hearts for mission. And then we need to be upskilled in personal evangelism, church planting, and cross-cultural mission. Thirdly, a wicked neglect of the poorer passengers who were locked in the lower decks while the rich boarded lifeboats. We need churches in our poorer districts. 30,000 people living in on, on our doorstep in Popomeni, many hundreds of thousands living around Maritzburg. We need more lifeboats. But here's the gut punch. Finally, a shocking lack of compassion among the crew and the passengers who are in half empty lifeboats, hovering around a mass of desperate people who were drowning in the icy waters. And they were unwilling to go back for fear that people would cause the, the boats to overturn. And so they waited for the screaming in the water to stop before they went back. Two, this is what the writer says, Richard Koken writes, too many of our half-empty churches are neglecting the desperate spiritual need of their communities who are drowning in their sin. Too many churches are effectively hiding until the screaming is stopped for fear of being swamped by the need or the hostility out there, end quote. It's tough to think through that, isn't it? But the question that Jonah ends with, this book, do we have compassion? Do we have compassion on the lost? One of the greatest dangers of any church 
especially as, as it grows and as it gets older, is that it stops having compassion for the outsider. It turns inward, in on itself, caring only for itself. Ministry ticks along. The rotors are filled. You know, the hall is comfortably filled itself. And so we're happy that we're saved, but we don't want the church to get too big. It's too impersonal. Don't want that. My God, not too many here, please, because I won't like it as much. I won't have the same kind of family feel that we've got going here. And so we stopped bringing people. We came more for our own comfort. Like Jonah sitting under that plant. Than those who are dying outside. And we might care for, we might care more for the way that we do things because that's how we've always done it here at church. It's what we're used to. Rather than thinking about how we can reach others, even if they might be very different culturally to us, generationally, they might be very different to us, which will change how we worship on a Sunday, how we, how we sing, the songs that we sing, what instruments we play, how we do hospitality, how we love and welcome people in. Our church, our church is not a cruise liner that is there for our entertainment and comfort. It is a lifeboat. Folks, we are a lifeboat that are sent out into the stormy seas of this world to rescue the lost. You have been pulled out of the water, gloriously pulled out of the water, shown great grace and mercy, and now you're being handed an oar and some life jackets so that you can start paddling out with your church family and to go find others. We have a taste for life. Because we've been rescued, we want to rescue others. Oh, it's so easy to be like Jonah, who verse 10 cared more about a plant. I bought a house a year and a half ago, I think. I can often care more about my house and my garden than I do for people. I can care more for sport and hobbies than for people. Instead of using what God has graciously given us, there's nothing wrong with homes and, and hobbies and sports. Instead of using those things to reach others, they become just about my own pleasure. The book of Jonah reminds us we have a God on mission. We have a God who cares. We have a God who has gut-wrenching compassion. He is saving people from hell or heaven. And we're told that when somebody finds this rescue, he erupts in praise. In Luke chapter 15, just before the parable of the, the lost son, the prodigal son, Jesus says this, there's joy. There's joy in the presence of God's angels over one sinner, one sinner that repents. My old um, professor at Bible college, Andy will know him, Doc Seckham, always had some amazing stories. But uh, he, he once, in, in a talk that he was doing for us Bible college students, he said that when people become Christians, he doesn't understand why we do this in South African culture, but we're just like, okay, oh, that's cool. Praise the Lord. That, that excited. Yeah. Not realizing how big it is. This is huge. Heaven is cheering. Like the spring box yesterday, when a try is scored, it erupts the atmosphere. That's what's going on in the heavenlies, but way bigger. All of heaven over one sinner who repents. We should celebrate. We should celebrate. And then he said this, and this just ties the whole talk together. And I promise you, this is what he said. My Bible college professor all these years ago, he said, we should go to Spur. Ice cream and sparklers for everyone. When somebody's converted, we must go celebrate. Christians should be known for our joy. Why? Because a sinner was lost and is now found. They were dead. And they're now alive. God is on a mission to save. And he has chosen to use us to do it. Let's recalibrate our hearts. And I'm going to pray in a moment that God will make us into a people with a taste for life, a people with gut-wrenching compassion on the lost so that we go and make disciples and then celebrate, celebrate with the angels, those who are being saved through our witness. You might be listening in today. And maybe you're not a Christian. I, want to take, I don't want to take for granted that everybody sitting in this room or, or tuning in online are Christians. You Sitting in church and even serving in church doesn't make you a Christian, believe it or not. But maybe through this talk, hearing of rescue, you might go, 
this feels a little bit like I'm being hunted, a little bit of, you know, the Christians are, you know, it's like a target on my back. I'm being chased after. The book of Jonah is here to show you that God is chasing after you and you have a great need. You have a great need. You do not know your right from your left. If you don't know God, you don't know your right from your left. He's offering you that forgiveness today because he's a God who forgives. He is holding out to you the hope of eternal life. No matter what your past, no matter what trails behind you, what disasters trail behind you, he offers you forgiveness. And he wants to pull you into this boat, this life raft, out of the waters and give you purpose and give you mission to recalibrate your heart to his this morning. God is not hunting you. He's not hunting you. He's not, you're not target to be taken down but you are lost and you need a rescue and he's throwing you a life jacket. I want to ask you to grab hold of it today. Do it. One of those Nazi leaders, Baron von Rittentrop was executed for his crimes. And as he was led to die, he was asked for his last words. They were as follows. I place all of my confidence in the lamb who has made atonement for my sins. May God have mercy on my soul. Then he looked at Gerica, one of the only people who had compassion on him in his life. And he said, I will see you again. Like the thief on the cross next to Jesus who begged for forgiveness. Remember what Jesus said to him? Today. Today you will be with me in paradise. If God can save men like this, can save you, call out to him and join his people with a taste for life. Let's pray. I'm going to pray in the first person. So pray this in your hearts with me. Almighty God, today I have been humbled. I confess that my heart has turned away from you, but I fall short of your glory and I need a rescue. Have mercy on me. Forgive me of my waywardness. Forgive me of my pride. Forgive me of my lack of compassion. And thank you that you have compassion on me, that you are gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in faithful love, relenting from disaster that I deserve, and that Jesus has paid it all in my place, recalibrates my heart this morning to see people the way you see people, and even those who have hurt me grievously. Help me to have a forgiving spirit. And even if I cannot minister to to them personally, to pray for them, to have compassion for them, and to reach out to the lost around me with the forgiveness Jesus offers, and to celebrate with wonderful joy those who are being saved. In your sovereign, gracious, merciful, and compassionate name we pray. Amen.